In this video, I'm going to take you through the differences between the RISC and CISC designs of processors. And this design relates to the instruction set of these processors. So what is an instruction set? Well, an instruction set is the group of instructions it is able to execute. And RISC and CISC refer to how big this instruction set is designed to be. Now, this instruction set is essentially a massive table. It can run into the hundreds and hundreds of pages where the instruction set gives us the different opcodes, the different operands, and also different addressing modes for these instructions. Quite a complicated document. Here is a snippet of actually a really, really basic and quite old CPU here from the 1980s, just because it was quite a clear example I could find. But you can search up CPUs and find the instruction set. It is a very, very long and complicated read. But if you were designing assembly code or a compiler or something like that, you'd have to really get your head around and understand how this all works. But from our perspective, it is just a list of instructions which the processor is able to carry out. We haven't defined what opcode operand or addressing mode works yet in this playlist, although that comes up later in the assembly code videos. Now, if you are creating a brand new CPU, you need to decide what the instruction set could contain. And this is made difficult because a processor doesn't necessarily need to be able to do loads of different really specific instructions because even quite simple instructions can often be broken down further. So to give you an example, something like multiply seems like a pretty obvious instruction to put in your instruction set. If you were gonna create a brand new CPU, you would assume we're gonna use multiply. But actually multiply could be reduced further down using multiple additions. So here I've got multiply five by three. Well, actually I don't need multiply here as a separate instruction. I could just have add being used three times. But to be honest, even add, I could break this down further if I wanted to. I could just have multiple instructions, which add one. Add five is one way of doing it. I could also just use ink five times, assuming ink adds one to my accumulator. So a decision I need to make as a CPU designer is, do I support multiply? Do I include it in my instruction set? Or do I just include add? Or do I not even include that at all? Do I only include increment? And a key factor in this decision is that for every instruction I have in my instruction set, I need to make sure I create a circuit which is able to carry out this instruction. So if I want to only have add as an instruction, I need to make an adder. But if I want to include multiply, I need to create a circuit which is able to multiply two binary numbers. So that is a key factor. The more instructions we have, the more circuits I need to have in my CPU because each instruction needs to be able to be completed by the CPU. So the RISC approach to processor design aims to have a small instruction set. It's not necessarily the smallest possible, but a relatively small instruction set with all of your different instructions being ones which a programmer would use regularly. So there isn't a magic number which constitutes a small instruction set, but typically this will be maybe between 30 and 100 instructions in total. RISC itself stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer. And some of the key features of RISC CPUs are that each instruction will perform a simple task individually, like add or subtract. If I want to do more complex tasks, like multiply or divide or use powers, I might need to combine multiple instructions together, like multiple additions. One of the neat things about RISC is each instruction takes exactly one clock cycle. So if your clock speed is 3.2 gigahertz, that is 3.2 billion clock cycles a second. That means it is able to do 3.2 billion instructions per second. And as I say, the CPU hardware is simpler because we've got fewer instructions we are supporting. And this means fewer transistors are needing to be used and it's easier to manufacture. So RISC CPUs are used typically in mobile devices like phones or smart watches, but also embedded systems. These are really simple computers used in things like washing machines. This is what this picture is from, a really simple computer used in a household item. And I'll say a bit more about why a bit later. CISC, on the other hand, stands for complex instruction set computer. This aims to have a larger instruction set. So we've got many more options available. These instructions cover lots of different tasks. And there is no magic number, like I say, but maybe we're talking a few hundred instructions, maybe up to one or 2,000 instructions in total. And the key features of CISC really are the opposite of RISC, but some instructions are gonna cover multiple operations in one go. You could argue that a multiply instruction is covering multiple additions in one go. One of the slightly awkward things about CISC is that different instructions may take different lengths of time to execute. So some instructions like add 
might take one clock cycle. But if I'm raising one number to the power of another number, that is a bit harder to do. That might take three clock cycles. And as we've said, because we've got more instructions to support, we need to have more complicated hardware in CISC. So it, it's harder to make, harder to design, and takes up more transistors. Now, CISC is used in most computers which are plugged in. So we're talking desktop PCs and also things like servers are almost always CISC computers. Some laptops are CISC, some laptops are RISC. Normally, if it has no fan, it will be a RISC laptop. If it has a fan, normally it will be a CISC laptop. Which brings us into some of the benefits of each of these two approaches. Because both have got benefits, both have got drawbacks. So let me go through the benefits of RISC first of all. And for each one of these benefits of RISC, this is also a corresponding drawback of CISC. So we can flip these points to give negatives as well. One of the key benefits of RISC is because our hardware is simpler, the CPU is cheaper and easier to manufacture because we need fewer transistors to make the circuits. Because there are fewer circuits in the CPU, it takes up less power, less electricity. This is why it's used a lot on mobile devices because mobile devices have got a battery. The battery life will be affected by the more power we use up. So therefore using less power means the battery will last for longer. And as a side effect of it using less power, less heat gets generated, so therefore less cooling is required. Your mobile phone hasn't got a fan inside it. Lots of laptops don't have fans inside them, neither do tablets, because we don't need fans, because it's a RISC CPU, not a CISC CPU. Because RISC instructions take exactly one clock cycle, it means pipe planning is a lot easier with RISC than it is with CISC. We can still do pipe planning with CISC, it's just more of a headache, because we have things like stalling and bottlenecks, where if we've got some simple instructions in the queue behind some more complicated ones, more complicated ones take a few clock cycles to finish. Everything else has got to wait for it to finish before the pipeline can progress. So we can use pipelining and the CPU will do clever stuff like out of order execution to fill in any spaces, but it's just harder with CISC. Now CISC does have benefits and it can be helpful to think of this in terms of where the burden goes. The burden with risk very much goes on the programmer. The programmer has more work to do if you are using a RISC CPU. It's very easy for the CPU manufacturer. For the CPU manufacturer, they've got quite an easy life because all they are doing is designing quite a simple CPU. For a RISC CPU company, they've got a lot more work to do. They need to create quite a complicated CPU chip. But the programmer has a slightly easier life because they've got a bigger range of instructions available to them. So the key benefits of CISC relate to it being a bit easier for programmers, people writing software. So programmers typically write software in a high level language, something like Python. Translating this high level language into the binary that the CPU actually uses is a lot quicker and easier using a CISC processor. That's because a high level language like Python has got loads of different instructions available to you. If we're going from a high level language into RISC, we've got to convert this wide range of instructions into a much smaller set of instructions, which is just a harder process to compile or interpret. Whereas if we're using a CISC CPU, there is still quite a lot of work for a compiler to do, but we've got a wider range of instructions available to us. It's easier to map it to a high level language. Now to be clear, a high level language, we can run that code on any CPU, as long as it is translated to the machine code. Sometimes though you choose to write programs in a low level language, Low level languages are either assembly code or machine code. Well, if you are doing this, it's easier to write this using a CISC instruction set because as a programmer, you've got more instructions you are able to use. RISC programs, you've got to try and figure out a way to implement complex logic using quite a small range of possible instructions. And later in the course, we look at assembly code. The assembly code you learn about is definitely a RISC assembly code. And you'll see that it can be quite tricky to write programs using only a small number of possible instructions. One of the consequences is a RISC program in either assembly code or machine code is usually a lot longer than a CISC program, which means if I'm using CISC, the programs take up less memory space or less storage space. So if I'm using a CISC processor, I might not need to have as much RAM as I do if I'm using a RISC processor. So like a lot of things in this hardware topic, the more of the course you have studied, the easier this is to all piece together. So if you are quite early on in your A-level, this may not make a huge amount of sense just yet, but it will make sense if you start to connect up the different topics, which you'll be learning about soon.